Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Desmarais, and uh, I'm working for FMA. Well, I, actually, I'm not working for FMA. I retired about six years ago. But uh, uh, looking at uh, the uh, South African landscape is so exciting that I came back to work and helped my friends uh, partner with uh, Oliver Wyman. We already partner with Oliver Wyman uh, in, in the past when we uh, uh, used to um, interview uh, bankers and insurers in South Africa. We issued a report a couple of years ago, uh, as we also did for uh, the Middle East and for Asia. So this time, uh, it's about uh, looking at digitalization in retail financial services in South Africa. But uh, I think it's also a lesson for most of the African countries, since we today have uh, participants from Angola, Congo, Egypt, Kenya, Mauritius, Nigeria, Pakistan, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, a lot of countries. Um, no need to tell you about EFMA. You know that it's an association of banks and insurance companies, and we have members uh, all over the world. Uh, we are pleased to partner with uh, uh, very renowned consultancy firms. And Oliver Wyman, uh, not only they are good friends, but they are also doing an excellent job. And I'm very proud of the, the, the report that has just been published and that you'll be able to download um, uh, regarding digitalization in retail financial services in South Africa. You know, it's based on a series of interviews and some of the interviewees are panelists today. So it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce Pierre Romani, who uh, actually uh, uh, led the, uh, the, the, the work together with EFMA. And uh, Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick, for, uh, for, the, for the nice introduction and the kind words. So um, at Olive Wyman, we are also uh, very proud to have uh, partnered up with EFMA once again. Uh, to, to publish a, a recent report on digitization in, in South Africa. Um, so we've been working in South Africa for, for a few decades now. And, um, and as we know, financial institutions have massively leveraged digital over the past uh, decade as a vector for growth uh, through digitization of, of products, of channels, processes. What we've uh, you know, witnessed recently is, is a new wave of digital plays that we believe will continue to shape uh, the financial services industries for, for some years to come. Um, we, we've identified seven plays, not to say that these are completely exhaustive, uh, but we think these seven plays are going to play uh, a, a critical role going forward in, in financial services in, in South Africa. Uh, some of these plays um, are in play uh, with some, some institutions uh, on the market. Some are just emerging. Um, I'm sure we will have some debates today as to the amount of value that different players um, think they can extract uh, from, from, from these various opportunities. Um, and, um, and so, as Patrick mentioned, we've, we've partnered with EFMA to, uh, to write a report and, 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 and deep dive a bit more into those those seven plays and really think about the value that they will generate or can potentially generate for both uh, clients, uh, but also shareholders. Uh, and as Patrick uh, mentioned, we've, we've interviewed uh, close to 10 uh, senior uh, executives uh, in financial services institutions on the market to also pick their brains as to uh, what they see the, the big plays as being and, and, and the value uh, being potentially uh, generated for, from, from these. So in terms of, of the seven plays, uh, I'm just looking at the screen now. Yeah, so the, the seven plays that we've uh, identified and that, we'll, uh, that we will use to center the, the discussion today are number one, the growth of platform organizations as industries collide. So with many organizations going uh, way beyond financial services um, through partnerships and, and greenfield pays. The, emerging, the emergence of uh, all-in-one ecosystem plays, uh, open architecture and regulation through open banking, importance of partnerships to help deliver innovation, expansion of products uh, offering through bank as a service, 
increasing of hyper of hyper personalization to deepen client understanding and the last one robo advisory becoming uh, uh, an integral part of of the banking experience so as i mentioned uh, these these plays uh, are are very much e emerging uh, on the market and we're very happy to have four of our uh, report participants and interviewees join us today for the for the panel to to further debate um, you know a number of these different plays and, and the values and and to uh, orchestrate the discussion and facilitate the discussion uh, we have we are joined today by Jason Egbert uh, our financial guru uh, doing extensive work on, on the on the continent uh, who will uh, introduce the the panelists that are here with us today so Jason over to you. Thank you, Pierre, and thank you for all the participants joining us today. Uh, just a quick introduction before I actually kick it off. Um, as Pierre mentioned, I've been working in the continent and globally um, around these topics for probably 25 years um, as a consultant as well as a banker, having had the opportunity to work with many of the banks that we're going to be speaking with today and payment providers, but also formerly at JP Morgan and Citi. So I'd like to bring a perspective that comes both from inside of the organization, but also as a, someone who's been consulting to organizations on the continent for a number of years. But that said, we have a, a star-studded a star -studded cast today of participants, which I'm super excited. They bring a wealth of experience on these topics and really can give some historical perspective as well as forward-looking views on how these themes are going to be shaking out. So we have Christina from NedBank. She's a, uh, an executive who's really been focusing on channel strategy, innovation, delivery. And channel is an important part of what we're going to be talking about, because that's essentially where uh, the rubber hits the road and starts talking about client experience. We have Stelios from NedBank, who's going to be talking about retail and business banking. Business banking and retail have been at the forefront of so much innovation globally. Um, and so really being able to draw upon his experience will help bring this to life. We have Derek from Discovery. Discovery is a global leading uh, innovator in this space. And so we hope he'll bring the innovation and payments, which we know is an area that's been disruptive, not only in the continent, but globally. So ability for him to bring, bring to life the payment experience, the card experience, financial occlusion experience, will really add a next level of depth to this. And then we have Rod. Rod's really been the architect of leading the chief change in business transformation at Standard Bank, which we all know is going through a massive transformation. So his ability to really draw on Standard Bank's experience, again, we expect it to really just add an, an additional dimension to this conversation. So we're very fortunate to have each of the four of you here today. Um, and so I just wanna thank you um, for your time and for your perspectives. Now to set some structure, right? So this does not evolve into an MMA match. What we have done today is essentially organize the conversation um, around four core questions. And these questions are really meant to be thought provoking. And so we want really to give you three to five minutes to really share your perspectives on how you see this transforming the industry, the challenges the industry will have to overcome, what it really means for those participants who are gonna be touched by this. I'm gonna have each one of you take one question and then I'm gonna take a step back. I'm gonna ask the other participants if they have something additive to um, build on and or to contrast. So each one of you are gonna have one question and then, then open it up to the others to share perspectives. Now I want this to be interactive. And so I would encourage the, those participating or viewing today to share chat questions. And as your chat questions come up, as we finish a question, I'll then bring those chat questions to the panel members to give them an opportunity. So those are the ground rules today. So let me just quickly touch on the four questions and then I'm gonna hand it over to Rod to share some initial perspectives. So drawing on the report, we wanna focus on four questions. Number one, do you envision more financial services organizations moving towards a platform play and beginning to offer a wider array of non-financial services products, essentially going beyond banking to help clients solve, grow their business, run their business better beyond just transacting and lending. That'll be the first one. The second question we're gonna ask the panelists to comment on, in particular Stelios, is how is your organization beginning to play in the broader ecosystem beyond traditional financial services? So Rod will give some perspectives on how he actually sees industry evolving, then Stelios will add, provide some color around what's going on at NetBank to bring it to life. We then wanna shift gears because we know partnerships are so fundamental to future bank propositions. And we wanna ask, 
Derek, what role will partnerships play in the future? And how is your organization preparing for this? We know partnerships has been a long conversation in banking and few partnerships have been able to really deliver on the ROI. So we're looking for Derek to really bring to life his experience in making that happen. We're gonna then uh, conclude with Christina, who we're gonna talk about what data capabilities will be required to embrace hyper-personalization of a client offering and how you're preparing for this. So we're gonna ground today's conversation in each of these four questions. And if we have time left over, we'll bring on some additional questions. So let me pause there. And Rod, first question to you. You've had a lot of experience thinking about this, both within Standard Bank, and I just gave you at least one minute to prepare your answer. So question one to you, Rod. Do you envision more financial services organizations moving towards a platform play and beginning to offer a wider array of non-financial services products? Rod? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Jason. I do, um, and I and I don't. I think it's. I don't think banks or financial institutions really have a choice, because industries around them are all changing, and offering. Um, I would say more value rather than just their particular product or service um, or solution. So I think financial services are all going to have to change. I think the question is, what are we going to change to? And if you look at the Standard Bank, I think our dilemma um, is we've got a parallel focus on changing a financial institution into a platform business with the extension of values that go beyond our products and solutions. So if you take a few examples of whether let's say it's home services or travel or insurance, et cetera, it's really when you step into the customer journey, what comes past and what is the next step once they've got a service or a solution from us? And then it's bringing that into our environment so that the client doesn't need to go and look for it. It's a seamless experience from the product or the solution they've purchased from us, but then the rest of the value chain rolls out before them. So that's whether it's an insurance or your small business, um, et cetera. So that's the one part is, do you create a platform business for your financial services business? The second part of it is, do you change your group to be a platform business? So in other words, you then become a construct which houses a financial services business, but then you also house other, in, other um, industry players. So whether that's the insurance, but the health industry, the education industry, et cetera, and you start to um, cross supply, uh, cross industries in terms of supplies and products to your, um, to your client. That might look like a little bit of an Amazon type construct where you don't just need to get books, you can get sports goods, you can get home services, et cetera. So I think that's the two questions. Is it, is it the financial services becoming a platform or is it your group becoming a platform housing, a financial services business? And I think both are kind of in our ambit to look at, but I think you've got to start off with being a digital organization. And I think all financial institutions are looking at that and digital to become platform, platform to become an ecosystem and partnerships become an ecosystem. So all of them build upon each other. So I think we're all on that journey. And then the financial services, I think, is a house or a, a construct that has, it's one of the most exciting times for financial services because we have so much rich data. We have so much information on going back years and years, not just in the time now platforms, but um, economies, um, industries, personal um, journeys, wealth creation journeys, et cetera that you can pull on and the data and the infrastructure and experiences, certain financial services that can really help um, a client. So I think the shift for us is that we used to service clients um, and decide what we what clients needed with our clients are kind of in the driving seat and we as financial services need to show up and step into their lives, whether it's in their personal life, in their um, small, medium enterprise life or in their wholesale life. It's dealing with the person and the future that they kind of um, believe in for themselves, whether that's the, the chief executive in a company, the manager in a company, et cetera, in terms of the changes they want to make or in their own personal life and how do we show up to, um, to provide that service. So I think in all, I don't think there's a services company that I haven't spoken to globally or in the country who's not thinking differently about what that proposition is. 
And I think the pandemic's only accelerated that into a digital um, platform that people are more comfortable with perhaps than they were 18 months, two years ago um, to use. So yes, the question, the question I do think there's a wide array of non-financial service, uh, financial services starting to expand um, into non-financial services, but people coming into the financial services market as well, who before wouldn't have seen that being a place for them to um, compete um, or partner with, with financial services. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Rod. And I guess, Derek, shifting to you from the insurance perspective, any thoughts, reactions, given what you're seeing to what Rod just shared? I'd like to pick up on just uh, one point that Rod made, which I fully agree with, which is that you've got to uh, shift your perspective from an inside out perspective to an outside in perspective. You've got to understand what it is that customers uh, actually want and what value you can provide to them. And I think it's very hard to do for traditional financial services products if you see them you know, as isolated products. You know, if you take transactional banking or you know, home loans or whatever it might be, um, it's very hard to compete in the space for that product as a traditional product in a world where everybody's already digitized uh, the delivery of those products. So I think you've got to first reimagine what the value is that you offer to customers. So in Discovery's case, uh, that actually hasn't changed since our inception. We try to uh, make people healthier and enhance and protect their lives. Um, so our financial services products are uh, built around delivering on that value proposition to customers. Uh, and I think once you've understood that that's your value proposition, it becomes a lot easier to then think about how you create a platform uh, that adds value both to the customer space. And then I think we'll talk about this just now when we get to the partner question, but around the whole ecosystem and how you integrate you know, various players in that ecosystem in through that value proposition and create a differentiated and then also scalable uh, digital platform experience. Fantastic, Derek. I think you know my key, my key takeaways is kind of raw, and you're basically saying it's it's a must have, not a could have. Um, it's about shifting your perspective from an outside in versus an inside out. And Derek, as you said, it's about really understanding, you know, the value of partnerships and how you partner to unlock value, which I think is a great segue. So thank you, both of you, for bringing perspectives. Uh, Christine Stilos, anything to add before I shift on to the next question? I want to be as inclusive as possible. Okay. So now I shift out from the market perspective for which Rod and Derek just shared essentially looking at the broader industry and what's going on. I want to double click on organization and Stelios from you. And if you think about the NetBank experience, how was your organization beginning to play in the broader ecosystem beyond traditional financial services? It'd be great if you can bring this to life through your own journey and experience. And I know the place you, the space you play in is an area of particularly uh, in, rich innovation. Thanks, thanks Jason, morning everyone. Um, to your point, I think we've, we've made the shift. Um, we start by quoting J.P. Morgan, CEO, uh, uh, his letter to the shareholders saying, banks are playing an increasingly smaller role in, in the financial system. And the value of traditional pipeline companies are declining when compared to the value of platform companies. Um, so it's all about the value. And I think Nedbank has absolutely taken that um, to heart and to market in, in a couple of ways, but I think primary and leading in that is we've recently launched uh, Evo, which is uh, a platform play. Um, and realizing that, you know, in Evo, uh, I think it was uh, Rod who mentioned some of the, the verticals that are, are key human needs, whether it's mobility, whether it's health, whether it's groceries, how do we play in that space? How do we show up in those journeys as, as a bank, as opposed to, you know, hoping that clients will leave those journeys and, and step out and come towards the bank. How do we embed ourselves in those journeys? So by creating that ecosystem in Avo, um, which covers many of the verticals that, that have been uh, articulated, 
you know, we really are starting to reach clients and merchants uh, and it creates a flywheel effect. I think that's what we're picking up. Um, you know, more access to customers, a larger pool of customers, increased effectiveness in the cross-selling and, and a much lower cost of acquisition. Um, so that's that's the one component. The other component is really around creating an API marketplace, which has uh, been in market for a good two and a half, three years now, and really, you know, exposing our services in true open banking kind of style and allowing clients uh, or, or, or users to, to pick up those services and use them um, as they feel they need to in their own business models. So a lot of work going into it, but I think at the, you know, at the, at the heart of it, it's really what NetBank is seeing is margins are being squeezed. Clients have changed significantly and we need to meet our clients in the journeys where they want to play. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in those various verticals that they are engrossed in day in and day out. And I think ever going to market is, is, is a big part of addressing that. If, if Stelios, if I can ask just a quick follow-up question, what has been your client response to seeing the evolving role of NetBank from a transactor um, to someone who's providing broader solutions? I think there's been a couple of elements to it. So I, I would think it would be um, normal for clients to step back a second and go, wow, what is a banker doing in the groceries business, in the takeaways business, in the liquor business, in the, in the gaming business? So I think at first, um, probably a little bit of retrospection from clients going, what's going on here? But I think as time has gone by and the convenience of an aggregated platform that brings everything under one roof that allows you to find the best deals and create value, um, to integrate the loyalty schemes into that so that they're used more broadly has, has really started to take off um, to the extent that we have over 400,000 registered users in such a short space of time is, is, is quite phenomenal. Fantastic. And I guess, Christina, I just want to pick up on something because you really are the tip of the spear um, for which kind of clients, uh, in, in many cases, will get to know the bank in new ways. How are you kind of seeing the channel proposition really evolve to deliver these beyond banking propositions? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jason, uh, and morning, everyone. Um, I think perhaps just before I answer your question directly, just one thing to add on to what Stelios was saying as well, is that one of the biggest benefits we've seen through, through AVO has been the benefit to our, our internal small businesses and businesses providing an additional uh, platform for them to be able to sell their goods and, 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 um, uh, and services on, which uh, traditionally they wouldn't have had access to. So it gives them significant access to, to, to individual clients that they wouldn't have been able to reach. And the other benefit to us is that we are engaging with people that traditionally would never have engaged with NetBank, which is also really great, um, that now uh, would, would join our bank. So from a channel perspective, it's, it's quite an interesting one. Obviously, I think channels are evolving at pace um, everywhere in response to how clients are changing. And the beyond banking one is no different because um, in the context of it, we are, are challenged every day to say, well, we're already grappling with, with tremendous pressures, whether it's cost to income pressures, uh, meeting client experience, et cetera. Um, at, a, at a rapidly changing pace in digitization um, and having to, if you like, transform our channel businesses to meet that need at, um, at a rapid pace, uh, which I think everybody is dealing with at the moment. I don't think that's unique to NetBank. Um, and in the context of that, over and above that, having to apply your mind to where and, and what the role is of your traditional businesses and your channel businesses and how that evolves to meet the need of, of beyond banking um, for our clients. So, um, I mean, I'll be very transparent. I think we're still in the very early days of integrating the two. We have allowed our Avo business to, to mature as a, as a platform play on the side. We have started to integrate uh, very much our thinking in terms of how do we use our significant network um, out there in the marketplace from a touch point perspective to give Avo legs as much as possible, um, but also to change the role, if you like, of all of our frontline people, et cetera, to start thinking. Um, uh, that AVO is a part of that operating model, that AVO is a part of who we and what we offer to the client. Um, so in the context of it, quite a big mindset shift in the channel businesses because going beyond banking, as I said, you know, and, and I wanted to maybe mention this earlier on as well, I think one of the most important things you, you can't lose sight of is that first and foremost, you have to be a bank. And you've got to do that really well. 
because if you're not, your customers don't take so well to all the other things you're trying to do. So I think in the channel space, our balance is always a very fine one. Like how do we make sure that we are delivering the banking services that we have to in the best possible way, deliver on that client expectation, um, and then bring in that beyond banking capabilities um, to transform what we offer the clients at extended level. Thank you. Listen, could I jump in there? I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. Please. How do you how, how do you capture the imagination of people who I don't think are naturally spending a lot of time or, or more time than they absolutely need to on a banking platform? Um, you know, when you're competing, I guess, with Facebook and Google and you know all these things, how do you get people to be more enthusiastic about spending more time on these uh, platforms? Good question, Derek. Good question. Christine, do you want to share some magic? Uh, Stelios might be better suited given his role in the digital platform. Stel, do you want to take that one? Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Derek, I think a fantastic question. Something we grapple with um, continuously because you're fighting for, for screen time uh, in reality. Um, I think what, what we've definitely seen is, um, to your point, you know, traditional you know, let's call it digital banking logons per user um, have significantly increased over a period of time. Um, first, it was by offering more services uh, beyond sort of um, transacting, make a payment as bread and butter kind of stuff. Then it became more around servicing uh, in terms of, you know, change your PIN, lock a card, replace a card, all those kind of things. And I think we've evolved now into new platforms which drive value that clients want to come in. Uh, if you think about why you go to take a lot, Amazon, et cetera, you know, finding great deals, using your points, um, you know, how do you start creating, uh, I know in, in your world it's around um, health, specifically in, in, in the typical banking, so how do you create financial health indicators? And, and, and start brewing all of those services out. So uh, an interesting challenge. I, I wouldn't say we've all cracked it, um, but definitely what I can say is our clients are comparing us to the Amazons, the, the Ubers, et cetera. So our experiences need to at least match up at a minimum to make sure that you're getting your fair um, share of, of, of screen time and, and value out of that. So a lot of focus on building experiences that resonate with clients. Um, I think you made the point earlier, um, building from the outside in. Um, and I think we've applied that um, and we're starting to see some of the benefits come through. Thank you all. I, I just want to step back. There's a good question in the chat because right now we've shared the innovation. You know, Derek kind of chimed in from insurance Rod, um, Stelios, Christina, you responded from banking, but there's a good question. I'd kind of be open to anybody who wants to answer this. The question is the competitive landscape for financial services is rapidly changing. And I'm curious to what extent traditional banks are driving the market and product innovation rather than trying to react to innovation driven by new market entrants. So who is basically setting the pace in the race? Any reaction, Rod? Jason, yeah, as, as I said, I don't think there, I think there's a combination of um, races going on at the same time. Because if you um, look at other industries, they're setting new standards and people are expecting, if they're experiencing something in another industry, they're experiencing, they want that ease and accessibility to be in your banking. So um, I think Stelios raised just now about um, social media. And, you know, you get, Social media is very easy to use. WhatsApp's very easy to use. Facebook's very easy to use, very intuitive. And you want that in your banking. So this sets a standard about where you find them, how you use it, the ease with in which to use it. And um, again, if I take the Avo example at NetBank, um, I know from a standard bank perspective, people were going to Avo and saying how easy it is to get onto Avo. That was the first thing, how oh, very easy to access it, um, very simple to use. Those are kind of the plus factors, but all industries are setting new standards in that construct. If you look at the retail industries, they it's the delivery, it's the logistics that sit behind it. You know, how quickly can I have something? And everyone's trying to get you the product or the service that you're buying as quickly as possible. So it's come from days to hours now to minutes and how quickly it can get. That puts pressure on financial services. 
to get the logistics, whether it's digital or physical, to the client or a decision as quickly as possible. Um, so I think it's a combination of, of different industries, combination of new technology that's putting pressure on the group. That's why the group has to become agile enough to adopt these practices and principles. You can't be a lagger um, and come in late. And I think I'm sure Christina and Stelis agree, these products don't have a long lifeline before they need to change and upgrade, um, before everyone's doing it. So it might start off as something that is very progressive and innovative for the client. And in no time, someone else is doing it or there's something else is doing something better. So I think you've got these combinations of not just in your own industry, but external industries are putting pressure on change um, and providing a real experience. And what we'll, I think I call the stickiness to why should you stay with us? Um, why should you stay on our platform? Um, and have the experience, um, which I think is also forcing us into, and I'll be interested when Derek talks um, about um, partnerships, is that I think the, the landscape has gone beyond where your competitor, you know, you can, competitors can also be partners now and bring different things to, to different um, clients. And I think Christina said an important thing about scale for your client. They're bringing somebody into the environment where they would never have had access. So all the other service providers would never have had access to the net bank scale of clients that they have. So it's a two-way street. It's not just us providing the platform, but it's also providing growth to our clients. Um, and the right. more and more they want to grow, the more and more we can provide services to them through our platform that they can just buy from us or rent from us. Um, they don't need to create that. They don't sometimes have the infrastructure or the cost instructor to house that, we can, we can rent it to them or we can provide a service to them. So I think it's a combination of, of, of all different drivers that um, are changing us. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Well, Christina, you've been very patient with your hand up. Do you wanna, you wanna comment? Uh, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, I think um, just this, a quick perspective. The one thing, you know, in the context of the question regarding reacting versus starting to lead the way, um, is, and, I, and I think this goes for multiple aspects of, of innovation and, and setting the trend, not only for platforms in, in the financial industry, um, but for a while, I think banks were rather reactive. We had to do it um, and we needed to bolster the muscle to, to meet that need, whether it be in convenience of, of services that needed to be in, you know, available in apps or whatever the case may be. We needed to react to that client experience. What I have found recently, um, and I think it's because banks have now started, and financial institutions largely, have started building significant muscle in the ability to, to build new capabilities and bring them to market. We are, I think we are starting to, in some ways, set the trend. Um, because the reality is that if the banks do get the acts together and we all do start building that momentum, we have the ability to set the trend um, uh, for many aspects of business and for client experience as a whole. We'll talk about hyper-personalization later, et cetera, but um, there is opportunity. And I think the momentum is shifting uh, in the industry. That's my perspective, just in the context of, of how things are going. I think the likes of Discovery coming to market with what they're setting as a trend as well and looking at things very differently um, uh, is a good example of things that could be different uh, to just being reactive to what's in the marketplace. Thanks, Christina. Derek, you practice patience. You want to share some perspectives? Oh, thanks, Christina, for demonstrating the use of the Zoom hand. Um, <laughs> to um, I just wanted to make one comment, which is that I think um, it's very hard for any experience where a lot of the digital thrust to date has been to make it more efficient to allow people to spend less time doing it. And I think a lot of banking and insurance products fall into that category. You know, the whole thrust of digital is how can we make it easier for people to do this quickly and spend as little time with us as possible. I think it's very hard uh, if that's your mindset and approach to compete with players that are thinking, how can they make this experience something that's far more addictive that people want to spend much more time doing that they want to spend more time engaging in. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges for financial services is how do we move out of digital as an efficiency play to digital mm -hmm. as a experience play? 
Yeah. Um, and I think that that, that challenge, uh, I think banking and, and insurance have yet to fully overcome. Yeah. And obviously incorporating other products and experiences. In our case, obviously that's wellness. You know, I think from Avo we heard, you know, a lot of partners selling through the platform. Um, but how you get that right, I think is something that's still open. Um, so yeah. I guess my answer to the panelists would be that I think that the people that have those experience plays are finding it harder than they thought to actually enter into financial services. And I think you've recently seen some of the bigger players uh, actually consciously withdraw from wanting to become full financial services players and start to make some of their products available for financial services players to partner with. And certainly you've seen that from Google when we've launched with Apple Pay locally, so have a number of others. Um, but I still think the fundamental problem the banks are going to have and that the insurers are going to have is how do we create an experience that people enjoy, that's positive, that people want to be spending yeah. more time on, rather than, gee, can we make this so quick that you hardly notice us? Wow. Derek, I think that's a very insightful point, right? Because, you know, digital has been for so many years a cost takeout. Um, and it's interesting, even from my experience, you know, having been a consultant for 15 years and a banker for 10 plus years there, um, before that, you know, it used to be when you're doing prod projects, people would say, well, I want to benchmark, you know, Citi, JP Morgan, or, you know, those kind of global institutions, as an example. It then started going into some of, you know, maybe some of the regional innovators, maybe in, you know, maybe it could be a, a DBS or maybe um, a Capital One just using banking examples. But increasingly, people are saying, you know, what is Google doing? You know, what is WhatsApp doing? You know, what is Ollie doing? What is Tencent doing? What is... You know, so you just see you see the spectrum really changing as people really seek to learn and draw on those experiences. But as I think Rod was saying, um, as well as Christine was saying, you know, we're building that muscle memory very quickly, given, you know, the capex we're putting into it, you know, the ability to kind of attract talent through our brand to really inject that and start leading the pace in many discussions. But that said, I want to I want to Rod, I don't I don't want to overlook your hand because you've been so patient. And before I shift to the next question, did you want to make a quick comment? Yes, thanks. I just wanted to say, I think we as a financial services can now come to the table with big tech with a different perspective. You know, I've, again, if I go back two, three years when we were talking to some of the big tech companies, we were a bank. And it was very much a question of what we can do for them as a bank. Whereas I think the conversation and the proposition have shifted, what can we do as partners? Yeah. Um, in terms of what you know, you've just said, in we providing what uh, Derek said, in we providing the financial services part of the payments platform or the construct, and they're providing you know the the other the other part of the value chain. I think that's yeah. shifted dramatically, and so us coming to the table is we can come there now to the table as more than a bank. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Ron. So let me, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to take from the audience, but I just want to pivot a little bit. Um, Derek, um, we've talked a lot about coopetition or collaboration with partners as thinking about, you know, reimagining reimagining the journey or making the experience of engagement richer, not just faster. Um, and through that, potentially bringing new solutions, insights, possibly beyond banking. So I guess the question to you is, you know, in your role, especially within the insurance, which we know is going through massive disruption and, and innovation, what role will partnerships play in the future? And how is your organization preparing? Well, interestingly enough, I think the first thing you have to get right is actually your product, which may not be the obvious place that most people would start when they think partnership. Um, because I think if you don't have a product that adds value to partners, you don't really have anything to discuss. You don't have a ticket to the game. And I think that's the first mistake a number of players are making is that they think, okay, well, let's go and sign up the partners first um, and then jointly we'll kind of figure out what the product is. I, I think you need an excellent product that truly differentiates you. And of course, that's incredibly hard to do because uh, we live in a world where products can easily be copied. You know, so in our case, that product or that chassis, as we like to call it, is definitely the whole vitality uh, wellness system. And once you have a digital product, it's something that you have to continually evolve. I think Rod mentioned it just now. 
Um, so then it becomes uh, a question of how do you integrate data science, the ability to rapidly release new features and iterations of that digital product. And once you've got all of that right, then I think you've got a very powerful base to go and have a conversation about partnerships. So in our case, that uh, conversation started with uh, uh, seeking global distribution. And we realized that we would not be able to uh, as quickly as our ambition uh, uh, really necessitated from us, expand globally. So we made a decision to go and white label in a way, although we've retained the brand, uh, the Vitality product through other insurers around the world. And we now have more than 40 partners uh, uh, around the world on, on every continent. So from zero to you know, global distribution in, in a few short years. Um, and that uh, really was the first thing. And I think it's also covered in the report uh, that uh, EFMA and uh, Oliver Wyman have put together here is, you know, that you need those partners to distribute digital products because your time uh, or your window of opportunity is so short and the competition is so global that you really need to be thinking, how do you get it out there very, very quickly? So I think that's the first thing where partners can help you. Once you have a differentiating uh, product. I think partners can also be very useful to help you add to and continue to innovate around that product. So for us, um, we realized that we, uh, we really needed some deep expertise um, around the Internet of Things. And we took a stake in a spin-off from MIT called Cambridge Mobile Telematics. Um, we also realized that there was an opportunity to monetize anonymized health data. And we took a stake in a company in Australia called Quantium Health, which is really a data science, big data company. Um, and we've made a number of other uh, uh, initiatives to bring in partners that can help us take what we think was already an excellent product, an excellent chassis, and further enhance it with particular niche expertise that they brought. And then finally, I think uh, the partner ecosystem for us um, is about uh, creating or trying to create those experiences that I was mentioning earlier for our uh, clients. We call them members. Um, so for our members, and uh, that is really about saying, you know, how do we uh, reward people um, for the way in which they manage their own health, whether that's physical health, mental health, which is very important with lockdown now, whether it's financial health in the banking sense, um, you know, or whether it's health in the sense of being carbon neutral, being green. Um, we've really uh, looked to reward partners there to work with us to offer our members uh, the ability to get discounts on healthy food, on movies, on cups of coffee, on vehicle rental, on travel. Um, and we've also extended some of those partnerships globally. Uh, for instance, with Apple and the Apple Watch, we're one of their bigger partners now around the world in terms of Apple Watch distributions. It's quite interesting that you can be this, you know, very niche South African company that's now expanded globally. <laughs> and, you know, you can become relevant to somebody like Apple because you're actually helping them sell watches around that's the right. world. Um, uh, so, you know, I think if you start with a product and you truly work on it, and you, know, you have to work on it night and day and it never stops, um, and you get that right, your opportunity to then partner because it's digital um, becomes, you know, enormous, you know, distribution, enhancing the product itself, and then enhancing the member experience all through partnership uh, all become possible. Yeah, thanks, Derek. And I think that goes back to what Rod was saying earlier, right? We have to be to some degree a, a, a digital organization uh, as a starting point, right? Uh, and then we have to ha build on to that, you know, a strong chassis. And then, as you said, moving the niche expertise, the data science example, then talking about potentially redefining the experience of the propositions. That's that's very helpful. Um, I want to, Rob, did you want to comment on that? I, otherwise, I wanted to zoom yeah, out I with just, some um, question. I think what, it, again, was just a thought, I'm thinking a lot here. It's something I've given thought to is how we cross industries with our technology. So a bit like the Uber and the, and the food industry or the restaurant industry, you know, Uber being you know, the transfer of goods or um, uh, transportation and then the food industry creating food. And I think we're seeing that industries are connecting, but you have to have the capability in your infrastructure and your IT and your API configuration 
to allow that to happen and that, that agility and that ease um, to cross over for partnerships, particularly whether you're going to put out with retailers or et cetera. They've got to, you've got to have that lock-in type construct of that they have ease to your platform, you have ease to their, their capabilities. So I also think particularly old banks have a spaghetti junction of um, old technology and infrastructure that's been modernized to allow that, that kind of seamlessness um, between partnerships, et cetera. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Rod. I mean, we, um, when we went global, we, we had all the product set, but um, we realized that the technology that we built over many years uh, in our sort of core South African market uh, wouldn't uh, be able, we wouldn't be able to deploy it quickly enough to partner with uh, global insurers. So we put um, a lot of money, more than $50 million into developing a version of our technology. So the same product, but a completely new technology stack that we could deploy really as a dot-com company would in, in our case in AWS, in Amazon Web Services. And we can now stand up a new partner from a technology perspective in a matter of days. So we've had instances where we've stood up a new insurance partner with the Vitality program uh, from the first engagement with them to actually having them live in the market in six weeks. And the technology is only a couple of days of that. So, you know, the rest is negotiating the agreements and the, the pricing and the marketing launches and so on. Um, and I think that's absolutely essential if you're, you can have whatever ambition you, you have, um, technology can either enable that or it can be a serious, uh, you know, handbrake if it's going to take, uh, you know, years to make the changes you need to, uh, to deploy with your partners. Well, the inf so all the spaghetti talk has made me hungry, but it also means that consultants love spaghetti diagrams of bank and insurance technology. I guess we're going to have to retire some of those. Um, but keeping on the thought of technology, in particular data, I want to shift to you, Christina. Kind of final question before we kind of go to some Q&A. Um, what data capabilities will be required to embrace hyper-personalization of client offering and how are you preparing for this? Any kind of experiences, lessons learned, things that if you could do it over again, you would based on yeah, thanks for that, Jason. Um, look, I think hyper personalization um, certainly to me is, is, and I'm sure the audience knows this quite well, is, is the next step in, in what many of us have been dabbling with in, in normal predictive analytics in next best actions or next best, ne next best products or uh, being able to customize our online experiences a little bit in the context of what our customers experience. Um, and Rod mentioned it earlier, you know, we ultimately have to keep up with the pace of, of what clients are experiencing in other industries. So if you think about what happens in, in e-commerce, whether it's Amazon or even what you, you see in your Netflix account when you've watched too much horror movies, um, is that they will continue to, through their own capabilities, uh, provide you with what's relevant to you. So they hyper-personalize your experience. Um, and it is therefore preemptive and very specific to your individual context. Um, and, you know, as banks, for us, uh, that can be applied in so many ways. And our customers will increasingly uh, um, expect that from us. And I think some players are starting to do that really well um, in the context uh, of, of leveraging things like behavioral science um, to be able to, to meet that need. And I'll talk a little bit about the data specific capabilities in in just a moment, but I do think it's still something that's quite early for many players in the market uh, to move to true hyper-personalization, not just generalization um, of segmentation, if you like, and, and meeting a particular need in that, in that fashion. Um, for banks, I mean, our application, whether it is in how we service clients and, and preempt um, how to meet a service need very differently, whether it's in how we design um, and the user experiences we provide online, uh, whether it is in um, our marketing capabilities, how we reach and where we reach our clients, um, our pricing capabilities, our product design um, and offerings, hyper-personalization can play a role um, in truly differentiating us in all of those environments. So I think it's uh, super important uh, for us as an industry that we really stay on top of this as, a, as an emerging trend. Um, the data capability is an interesting one because Rod touched on it earlier, like you would think banks would be in the prime position here. <laughs> Uh, you know, we sit on such a wealth of information. 
um, and our data sources are vast, I mean, both historical, but also in terms of our ability to see spending patterns of clients real time. Um, uh, and so much um, in, in the context of what we can add as, as value um, and Internet of Things coming to the fore and what that provides uh, as real-time information. Um, the challenge, though, um, and certainly what I find in my own uh, world is that we're still very much grappling with pure descriptive analytics in many cases, um, and that the wealth of analytics uh, or the wealth of data that we sit on in our data marts is quite difficult to mine in the context of it being real time and available to the extent that we need it to. You know, hyper personalization is only relevant to the client if it is real time. Um, and if you are meeting that client need in a way um, that is contextual and at that right spot, you know, it's no use in doing it six hours later or two days later when that, that iron is no longer hot. So for me, the biggest uh, challenges I, I believe we face in the context of hyper personalization truly getting there is our own ability to leverage capabilities such as our machine learning, data science strengths that we've got to continue to build and invest in um, to be able to mine this wealth of big data that we're sitting on um, and to bring that alive for, for proper use cases in the market. Um, so, you know, I, I think without hopping too much on the, on, on the issue, that's certainly where we are at at the moment is I think that I, I always see data almost in, as a Maslow of hierarchy. You've got to have the basics in place um, and make sure that that's you know, firmly um, available, accurate, timely, um, et cetera. And then you can build all the cool stuff on top of it in, in prescriptive and predictive analytics. Um, yeah. So we're still very much challenging uh, and challenged with that all the way up that funnel in terms of really making sure we can unleash that power that sits within. Um, and there's a huge amount that we can do with third party. Uh, I mean, some of what we've seen in the market with real time mobile tagging uh, and really being able to see where clients are um, uh, and, and how we can construct our sales strategies and a whole bunch of other things on the back of that is super powerful. Um, uh, and I really do think um, holistically, uh, the strength of data in our organizations uh, is there for the grabbing um, and there's a competitive edge for those that can, can use it. And hyper personalization is one of those use cases. Uh, for data in the construct, how we bring it alive. Fantastic, Christina. I, you know, I can imagine there used to, I used to be a transaction banker back in the day, and there used to be a story that um, if someone at a dinner party found out you were a transaction banker, you would likely never be invited back to the party. And I suspect the same thing, you know, I suspect the same thing is for data. Five or 10 years ago, you said, oh, I'm a data scientist. It's a quick, it's a quick way to get uh, disinvited from the party. But now you go to a party, everybody wants to talk data. But I guess with that said, Derek, um, as one of the largest Apple distributors, wa watch distributors, um, uh, what are some of your experiences kind of thinking about the whole data journey? Yeah, I think Christina's already made some very good points. So I'll just uh, briefly add to them. I think the first generation of uh, data science, um, and it's, it's weird to think we're already on the second generation of something that's still relatively new. But the first generation, I think data scientists spent a lot of time uh, developing models that compensated for data, which was quite noisy and often incomplete. And they became extraordinarily good at it. And the second thing was that they became very good at uh, developing indices and models uh, that uh, really took you know, anything from you know, 12 to 12 hours to a week to actually uh, index and, and, and keep on developing. And I think actually those two competencies in a way hold us back now because uh, as uh, Christina already mentioned, I think we're now moving into an era where it's gotta be real time in order to personalize the experience. And to be real time, you can't have noisy data. Even if your model is derived from noisy data, the data you have about that particular individual that you wanna prompt for the next step on their journey has to be absolutely perfect. Um, so a lot of emphasis now going into data governance and making sure that your data is absolutely perfect. And a lot of technology innovation going into integrating data science with your real-time servicing and sales capabilities. And then one thing I'd just like to add um, is that all of this also has to come with very good controls around privacy and a very clear ethical framework for how to use data. You know, I think in some ways it can be quite disconcerting for someone if every time they try and do something with a bank or insurer, we kind of say, oh, we know something about you. Here's the other thing we think you should be doing. Um, and I think you've got to think through the ethical elements of that 
uh, the experience elements of that. Um, and then, of course, you've got to be compliant with the privacy legislation. And, and I think, in essence, always let that client or member uh, know that they're in control of their data and that what you do with that data is to their advantage. Um, and as long as you're doing it to their advantage, they're happy for you to get some advantage out of it. But the second it's not to their advantage, I think you're going to fall foul um, of both regulators and, and members. Uh, and, and the backlash can be quite severe with social media and, and other channels. Thanks for that, Derek. That's very insightful. And I agree, right? One, one has to be mindful that you don't go, you don't go too big brother such that you know the instantaneous social media then scathes you. But no, I wanna, everybody, this has been super rich in sharing experiences and perspective, let alone anecdotes and facts. I wanna zoom back. We only have two minutes, so I'm gonna keep this short, but there was an interesting question um, in the, uh, from, the, from the audience um, where they said, some of the platforms have been mentioned all, or, um, already, um, there is talk of various platforms entering the banking space. Amazon's the classic one. Um, so the question really to you all is, across banking and insurance, who are the firms that really keep you up at night in regards to potentially their getting involved in financial services? So I'm going to start with Rod, um, maybe, or I'll, I'll let whoever wants to speak. So it's a democracy. Anybody want to share some perspectives? One or two firms that keep you up at night? Jason, I'll just uh, make a statement. You know, I think, again, you'll get players who might not compete with you as a fully-fledged financial services group, but they'll certainly can take a piece of your market, whether that's the payments market or another piece, that they can provide a service and infrastructure. And I think you've got to look at the competition in the boutique-type offerings that are coming through, which could be a relevantly big market for you, and you start to lose clients to that offering of another service provider, and in turn, you lose the client for good because then they go on to use the value chains of that um, that provider. So I think that would be, you know, my answer to that. Thanks, Rod. Stelios, good use of the hand. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a it's a very good question. I mean, in my in my mind, I think you know some of the players that have recently entered the market, Voda Pay, uh, would definitely keep some of us up. Um, massive client bases that they could leverage, uh, you know, whether that's uh, selling financial products, insurance products, um, you know, creating their own uh, ecosystems, which they've recently done. Uh, definitely, definitely um, big, big risks to, to the banking industry and the insurance industry. And then, of course, if you ask the question, who's the Amazon of Africa? Um, we don't really have one yet, right? So they, they are obvious risks, you know, who's going to partner with who. Um, and there might be some things coming from left field that none of us have ever seen. So I think we're always on our toes. Um, but I think we're in for an interesting next two, three, four years. Fantastic. Um, so, Leos, if anything, it sounds like all of you are on your toes already. So it seems like you're going to be well prepared for the uncertainty. Um, I, I, before I hand it back to Pierre, I just want to personally thank you all for sharing your perspectives, your experience. I'm sure the audience benefited from it greatly. Um, Christina Rod, Derek, Stelios, thank you so much for your time and perspectives. Uh, with that said, I'm going to hand it back to Pierre to wrap it up um, and take us forward. Thanks, uh, Jason. So I'm going to go for the one minute, uh, 60 second uh, conclusion. Uh, and, and before I thank everyone, I, I'll just read out what, what is my kind of one sentence uh, takeaway from, from this great discussion today uh, for, for more debate later. Uh, so here we go. Financial institutions are becoming trendsetters by focusing on their experience to consumers while leveraging their core FS DNA and becoming partners uh, to big challenges um, rather than competitors. Uh, so it's just uh, trying to kind of sum up some of the some of the key uh, salient points of the discussion. But I mean, once again, thank you very much for, for a great discussion today. Thank you to our, our four panelists for uh, engaging uh, on the scene the discussion. Uh, thank you uh, to EFMA for partnering us, uh, partnering up with us with Oliver Wyman once again. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to the Oliver Wyman team 
for uh, you know the heavy lifting on, on on this great report and thank you to all, all our attendees today from for connecting uh, you know from uh, far and beyond so thank you very much everybody <laughs>